Welcome to the show today. My guest today is Jay Wong. He's an entrepreneur, podcast host, and speaker based in Toronto. Jay is committed to helping creators and entrepreneurs get their message out to the world in a bigger way. He's the host and producer of the Inner Change Maker podcast, ranked as number one self-help podcast when he launched, and named as a top 10 business podcast for 2016 from Podcast Awards. He's interviewed high-profile entrepreneurs and world-class creators, such as Grant Cardone, Tom Bilyeu, Naveen Jain, and many other prominent names around the world. He also runs an online education business, which consists of a white-glove podcast agency and do-it-yourself accelerators and memberships that help business owners launch successful podcasts. I wanted to bring Jay on the show to find out how he grew his own podcast, how he translated podcast success to business success, how he helps others replicate this, and what's next for him. So, Jay, welcome to the show. James, let's do this, man. So <laughs> pumped to be here. I know it's been a long time coming, and uh, just excited to share with you and your audience. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate us finally making the time. It's, it has been a long time coming, so really appreciate it. So, I was hoping we could start a little bit about your background and your story. So, could you just tell us a bit about what life was like growing up for you and I think one thing that would be especially interesting to to maybe highlight would just be about your your parents influence on you uh, with their own entrepreneurship journey and so maybe if we could just get a bit of a sense of your background sure sure um you know I think that that's always kind of a great place to start right we're right at the beginning and you know for for me um I've always when you listen to a lot of different interviews and when you talk with a lot of different entrepreneurs people always have those stories of hey you know when i was a kid you know i used to buy and sell you know baseball cards or i used to have like a newspaper route i never had any of those necessary things but what i would always do was i would uh, i would at least try to help uh, with my parents' businesses. And, you know, growing up, they had kind of like a, a convenience store. Um, I don't know what, you know, if there's a certain name, big brand yep. name in, in Australia, but this is kind of like the time before 7-Elevens, you know, if anybody's listening in, in like North America. Uh, this, it, you know, convenience stores were actual small businesses that, you know, people would kind of go and frequent all the time. And, um, you know, I just remember growing up and we had a couple different um, convenience stores. So we moved around just a couple times. Uh, my parents at that time actually owned the building that, that they were in. So they would actually uh, rent up kind of like the upstairs of the building. They'd run the convenience store on the like the base kind of level of it. And then we ended up just living in like the basement actually of, of the property. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny looking back because they always, you know, the, growing up, we didn't have a lot of you know, money, we didn't have a lot of wealth, you know, we didn't have a lot of connections, you know, if we can imagine, you know, my parents were both, you know, just, just about 30 years old when they immigrated to Canada from mm. south of China, from Hong Kong, and, you know, they had each other, right? They had jobs, you know, and they were, mm. you know, could barely kind of make it by and, you know, they, you know, they, they came through, um, you know, even my dad, I remember when, you know, he would share stories of, you know, escaping essentially Vietnam at that time. Um, his family was was essentially there, even though he's he's Chinese, um, and and being a refugee for a period, you know, wow. himself, right? And you know, coming to Canada, you know, noticing how you know caring and 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 kind people were. You know, they didn't speak the language. You know, can you imagine like being 30 years old? You know, I just turned 30 a few weeks ago, and I can't even imagine you having to right? Relearn an entire new language, right? Having to give up, you know, whatever network you did have, you know, whatever friends you did grow up with, right? And regardless of good or bad, just having to start over, you know? And so we, we never had a lot kind of growing up. But one thing I always noticed from my parents were they were always trying to find ways to not just get by, but to kind of create opportunities for, for themselves. Um, you know, some some led to some good things um, and, and some led to some not good things. Right. And I think that's just mm -hmm. it's part of life. It's part of business. There's ups, there's downs. Um, but they always, you know, kind of instilled in, in my brother and I, you know, great set of values, 
great sets of beliefs, always to kind of push us to say, hey, we, we can do anything that we really want to go after. It's really just about choosing, right? Yeah. And so I, I, in a lot of ways, I feel, you know, a lot of gratitude, you know, getting a chance to, because um, back then it wasn't like, you know, you, you didn't think of your parents as like these great entrepreneurs, <laughs> you know, like it just didn't exist as much, yeah. right? Like they just did things because they, you know, if you ask my mom, it's like, hey, why, why, why the convenience stores, right? Why the small businesses? She would say, because I wanted it to control how I spent my time and I wanted to have time to spend with my kids, mm-hmm. right? I didn't want to do the commute you know, to, to work. I didn't want to having to spend, you know, eight to 10 hours, maybe away from my children. Right. Mm. And that was their way of justifying it. And, you know, um, it, it was really cool to get a chance to kind of grow up around that, um, grow up with a tremendous amount of love, tremendous amount of support, even though we didn't have all that financial backing and what have you. Um, it certainly helped me become, you know, the person I am today. Yeah. That's amazing. And I can definitely see how that would impact you and, and give you that determination and focus moving forward. So could you maybe talk about some of the early projects that you worked on in your own journey? So I believe there was some interesting projects. You had like a paint business and some other things like that. So could you maybe just talk a bit about those early projects for you? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's um, th- there, was a, there was a period where um, we had kind of moved over to the U S my family and I, and, um, I won't go into, you know, part, part of the reason why we were there, but my family was running this, uh, restaurant back then. And, um, you know, long story short, this was one of those scenarios that it didn't work out, you know, and, you know, they ultimately ended up having to declare bankruptcy, uh, on, on that restaurant and on the building of, of that restaurant. And it was this huge, you know, catastrophe. And I remember just being, you know, 16, 16 years old right then, um, you know, when, when we got the news, you know, you know, horrified, right? I remember yeah. standing in the back of the restaurant just crying, you know, hugging wow. my family because you, you don't really know what to do. You don't really know how to process things, or at least I didn't um, as, as a teenager. But I'll tell you, uh, the reason I share that is not so, you know, I, I want to get some sympathy or anything like that, but because that was one of those times where I decided that, you know, I don't know if I could have done anything. You know, I, I wish I knew more about business. I wish I knew more about economics and cash flow. And, and I, I wish, you know, I, I could have been able to prevent that, you know, for, for my family or, or been able to help in a bigger way. Right. And yep. I, I pretty much made a decision there that, hey, I was going to go after and figure out not only how to maybe prevent a scenario like this from ever playing out, but to be smarter and, and, and wiser and, and stronger and, and to, to, and to be able to, you know, take life a little more seriously, you know? And so I I remember when I joined, um, when I was in business school, I got the opportunity of running uh, a painting business, uh, out of all things. And it was with this amazing company called, uh, student works. Uh, they're all across Canada and uh, they're they're absolutely amazing. And and what it is is that you essentially run a painting business. They'll they'll kind of teach you and train you, um, 18, 19 year olds to essentially run a, a franchise painting business under their kind of umbrella, right? And mm. you know I remember back then it was probably easily the most stressful thing I've ever had to be a part of, right? We were doing right. you know door to door knocking in the in the winter of Canada. Right. Literally, I'm, you know, blizzards are outside. I'm like, we got to go. We got to figure out how to get more leads. Right. And we're going door to door trying to do some give people these free estimates, you know, and, you know, it was, you know, once it hit the 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 summer months. Right. What like May, June, July, August. Those were our production months. Right. Mm. And I mean, you know, it went from door to door knocking to training to hiring people. I remember we had, uh, I think, eight, uh, four different teams at the, the highest point, eight different people. Everybody is older than me. Right. I'm 18 years old. I have no idea what I'm doing. It certainly feels like I have no idea what I'm doing. There's more problems than I can solve. You know, every single day, the second I turned on my phone at 8 a.m., there'd be like all these all these voicemails, you know, 
And, you know, I wouldn't go to bed until 10, 11 p.m. because, you know, you stay after and, you know, you, you try to work out, you try to clean all the tools beforehand. But that experience really gave me, um, I remember coming back to business school the next semester, right, like the, the in the next year. And pretty much from that point on, um, I just thought, you know, the education system and the business school, not nothing against the business school I went to, but I just thought that everything was a bit of a joke, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, after you, you kind of get that real life experience, you know, I didn't even finish in like the top 10%. We were in, I was in the, like the top quartile. I think I hit like $65,000 in like eight months, something like that, where I, I, I made the most money out of all like my like roommates. Um, mm -hmm. and out of the 65, I think I had like 12, I came away from the summer with like 12 or 13,000 cash. Right. Wow. And I remember thinking like, I'm, I'm rich, you know, James, <laughs> like I've made it, you know, and this was back in almost a decade ago, or it is a decade ago, decade plus ago. Um, yeah. and it, it was just such a, one of those experiences that when you go through it, you realize, Hey, you know what? That I, I am going to try to figure out how to be able to do things like this for the rest of my life, you know, mm -hmm. and how to be able to have that control on people around me. What, what I do, what type of business I'm in. And um, yeah, the, the rest is kind of history from, from there. Yeah, that sounds like such a great experience. I love as well that you had to do door-to-door -door sales. That's something that, that I did as well early in my career. And I think it was one of the, the best things that I ever did in terms of learning sales and just being able to, to walk up to people and, and, and sell. Was that impactful for you learning that skill as well? You know, it's funny. I, I had a uh, interview with Patrick Bet David um, from Valuetainment, right? Some of your mm. listeners might might know who he is. If you don't, you should 100% check out his channel. It's it's pretty amazing uh, on, on YouTube. But you know, he told me that uh, I remember in our interview, he said one of the hardest things you should do if you are if you have any fear of like rejection if you're like not too sure about yourself is go and do door to door sales for yep. like a period right i think he yep. said like i don't know if he said 6 months or 2 years but like a period right yep. and when you do that what ends up happening is that you you get rejected so often that it kind of loses all all the 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 it demystifies it for you a little bit you know what I mean? Yeah. You realize people are just people, right? You realize people totally. are just being human. You know, you realize that selling is simply solving problems, right? Yes. If somebody says, hey, I got a problem with this, or if you can identify a problem before going into a conversation, then that's that, that you're creating some leverage there, you know? And, and I just remember being 18, um, and trying to figure out how to be able to do this. I never really had an issue with rejection per se, um, but you know, certainly it has been tremendous you know, as I look back over the last few years because it built the, those foundations in, in sales and persuasion and, and just communication, right? Um, mm. And we could talk more about that, but you know, it's, it's something yeah. I always look at, at younger entrepreneurs uh, that are quote unquote coming up Right. And it's like, well, if you lose that, if you don't have that like human, uh, that that ability of connecting with like an absolute stranger right away, you know, and even if it doesn't result in a sale, even if it doesn't result in, in anything like good for the business number wise. Right. Could you be able to have that conversation? It, it, it certainly um, was a great foundational piece for me, for sure. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. And it's, it translates into everything as well. So as you said at the end there, it's not just about selling a product or getting money in the door necessarily. Even, for example, with this podcast, like just getting guests on the show, that's, that's sales. Doing, doing anything is, is sales essentially. So it's an important skill and, and I couldn't agree more with, with what you said. So it's great. So what happened next after the painting business? When did the opportunity... Uh, to work for Dan Sullivan come come about was that what happened next after that? You know, it's funny that um, we're we're kind of taking a bit of a, a jump, but it's it's a really good jump, and I'll, let me explain why. Because the way I actually got into Strategic Coach was because 
Um, I was trying to pursue a single uh, startup kind of right out of business school and um, well, it failed. And uh, we, we you know, took out some student loans, try to like make it happen, lost all the student loan money, ended up owing student loans, right? Oh. And it's like, oh man, like w- what are we doing here? And um, I said, you know what, I, I just need to, I, I need to figure out um, what I'm gonna do next. And, and I think I need to surround myself with the right types of people. You know, mm. because I, I kind of had that inkling that I, I wanted to go out and, and do those things. I wanted to, you know, leverage my, my skills and abilities and, and, and be impactful, you know, for a company, for, for myself at, at some at some venture. But to be honest, I was I was I was so scared from from for failing. Right. And, you know, no one ever wants to, like, look bad. You know what yes. I mean? No one ever wants to say, hey, I lost all, you know, a, a few thousand, even a few thousand dollars, right? You, there's mm-hmm. like guilt and shame around that. Um, and so, you know, what's funny is that I, I, uh, I went to school in Ottawa, which is, um, it's actually the capital of, of Canada for fun fact for everybody. Uh, <laughs> most people think it's Toronto. And, uh, you know, I ended up, I, and most of my friends moved to Toronto because bigger city, more opportunities, bigger companies are there, right? And um, I, can't, I didn't go through the whole hiring process when everybody did because I was like, guys, I'm going to be the next, you know, cabillionaire um, in the next few years, right, with my startup. Uh, so I don't need to apply to all these, you know, all these companies that are hiring these recent grads. And um, so I didn't really have that, those same, like, kind of, like, opportunities. And so what I did was I, I looked back in my network and I said, who is successful? Like, who would I deem successful? Who would I say is ahead of me, right? And one of those people was the actual CEO of StudentWorks. And I reached out to him. I, I, I kind of told him a little bit of my, the story. I was like, I don't know if you remember me, but, you know, we, we did this thing with you, like, in my first year of university, so, like, you know, four years ago. And uh, we, we ended up connecting, and he was the guy who ended up connecting me to Strategic Coach uh, mm-hmm. because he had went there when he was building up his business, like, years ago. Um, and it, it was just such a cool moment, right, for, for right. us to kind of, like, have that you know connection again and then for him to be able to refer me in um now for context just explain just what strategic coach is just for the audience quickly if you don't mind Joe. perfect yeah yeah so for for um for context strategic coach is it's kind of like the harvard or yale for successful proven entrepreneurs so they only cater to pretty much like the the one percent of business owners Right. People that are not only successful, but paying themselves pre- at a pretty high rate. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have to be making net income. Net income means that this is your take home. Right. Most a lot of entrepreneurs, it's easy to say, hey, I have a seven figure business. That's like gross revenue. Right. But minus, you know, expenses, minus cost of goods sold, minus all those things. Then you're left with whatever you pay yourself. Right. Um, for clarification, this program only, almost exclusively works on referrals. Um, they do very, very little of like outside marketing, a little more in the last few years for sure. Um, but I'm pretty sure like one of the levels for them is that you got to be paying yourself at least a quarter million in, in net net income every single year. So um, d- some of their clients are literally the you know, it's the industry leaders and whatever niche that that you can think of, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, from people like a a Peter Diamantis, you know, who's trying to put people on the moon and, 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 you know, help everyone, you know, get, you know, be outside of the planet and, and, and going into space to, you know, internet marketers like Frank Kern and, and Jeff Walker. These are guys that are responsible for, you know, multi millions and millions of dollars to um to new york right there's uh there's a, a very famous deli called the cat's deli right mm-hmm. and i remember meeting those brothers that that are there and these are these are entrepreneurs that are not looking to compete they are looking to dominate and be the go-to mm-hmm. business you know they're at they're at seven and eight figures looking to go to nine or to a billion right and yeah. uh it was it was very intimidating you know being around um, those levels of, of, of thinkers, you know, those yeah. levels of processors, you know, um, you had some of the wealthiest, uh, plastic surgeons, you know, and doctors, 
uh, from all over the world. You know, tons of clients from UK, Australia, uh, but just a, a very uh, an extreme. Uh, you know, it, it was absolutely just amazing being around them. And if you can imagine, James, I'm, I'm 22 years old at this point. Uh, I came graduated business school, so I came, you know, dressed in, in these three piece suits, and you know. <laughs> All these guys that are making, you know, a hundred thousand times more money, they're, you know, they come dressed as relaxed as, you know, as can be, right? Mm. Professional, right? But, you know, they're they're looking at me like, right, like the, I'm just some guy sitting in the back <laughs> of the room, trying to consume as much knowledge, and it, it was it was, um, you know, certainly certainly quite the adventure there. Yeah. So, what was? How did you actually fit into that? Because obviously, at that time, you weren't making a quarter of a mil. A year. <laughs> so, what was, um, I guess, your your angle of getting into that whole ecosystem? So, I, so I, I literally, so I literally worked for Strategic Coach, right? So, yeah. I, they hired me as a, they called it a, a consultant, but really it was a sales business development consultant because you know a lot. Once again, most of the company worked on referrals. And uh, just because if you can imagine people in that are in the 1% or in the, say, top 5% of, of business owners, typically they know other top 5%, you know, business owners. Uh, yeah. So it was a lot of relationship building, consultative yeah. selling, right? Uh, long phone calls, you know, like it wasn't about volume per se, but it was about it was about depth, right? It was about relationship, you know, yeah. it was about who you knew, right? So um that that's you know kind of how I fit in there, um, and I was there for I was lucky to be a part of that that family for uh, a couple of years, just over a couple of years, and um, they 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 helped me a lot you know along yeah. the way. Yeah, I can imagine that would have been such an amazing experience because you you become a product of your environment, and if that's that's your environment, that would have been just absolutely amazing. So what what an opportunity, and I guess is there. Is there anything specific you can remember that you learned from that that you you sort of took? Obviously, there would have been a lot you learned just from osmosis of being around those kinds of people. But is there anything specific that you could share that you remember learning from that whole experience? Yeah, you know, so tons, right? I mean, you know, I, I discovered that Toronto has a airport specific to private jets. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that, that was a, like a little fun fact. And, uh, you know, obviously I, I was like, you know, so, so-and-so said the name of this airport and I can't think of it right now, but obviously yeah. because I don't, all, I still don't have a private jet. So, um, <laughs> I do not frequent said airport, but, um, you know, they were, they were complaining about this airport and, um, you know, just like many things, right. About, you know, um, how people operated, but, you know, one of the things about being a part of a culture like strategic coach is that, as you can imagine, we, we do goal setting quite a bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not really even like goal setting. Um, there's different tools and different exercises that they kind of walk you through, but certainly every single time we met as a company, um, people would always want to look at like, Hey, what, what are you presently like happy about? What are you, what did you do in the last 90 days that, that made you feel amazing that you're happy to share, right? What is going to happen in the next 90 days that you're excited about, right? Like kind of like a basic framework like that. And, um, I remember, and, and this is kind of what started my own kind of thinking of evolving and going into my own, which is I started getting comfortable, James, on sharing the same goals over and over again. And I realized that sometimes some of my goals were so big and kind of like cool sounding. You know, I'll give you a couple of examples. Hey, one day I want to, you know, have my own company and, and be able to, you know, impact people in a positive way. Hey, one day I want to be able to use my voice and my, my communication and my abilities to, to serve people. You know, I want to be able to speak on stages. I want to be able to write my book one day. I want to be able to, you know, uh, be able to have a show, right? Like all these like things that are cool, right? But I kept saying like one day I'm, I'm going to be ready. You know, one day it, it's, it's, it's going to happen. Right. And the thing is, if any one of you have ever had that experience where you've had goals and you share it with people and they're impressed at your goals. Right. I can always like map out how people will react to how you share things. You know what I mean? And for me, I realized that they're always going to be impressed, but it's never going to become a reality if I just talk about it. I write yeah. it down and talk about it. 
and I'm never out there doing things. You know, that was one of the biggest conflicts, to be honest with you, um, of being in an environment like that, right? Because I guess for, you know, what, <laughs> you know, for uh, what I was going to say was like for, for entrepreneurs, like when you're in an environment where even the smallest level of constraints, right? Even if there's rules and, and, and things that kind of like abide by, you start feeling like you're not creating and you're not contributing in the best way that you can, you know? And, um, I remember reading, uh, one of, uh, D Dan's books and Dan has all these like books and he writes a book like every quarter and, uh -huh. you know, it's, 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 it, it's, it's pretty insane. Um, but he has these like quote books, right. And th they got me to do this when I first got hired, you know what I mean? They, they put me in an office and pretty much put like, you know, a stack of books on the next stack of books. And they're like, your job is like literally deep dive into all this content, you know what I mean? Wow. And, and know this. Right. And so I remember reading one of the quote books and, and the quote went something along the lines of, um, you know, all entrepreneurs are unemployable. Mm. And I thought, and, 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 you know, when I heard that it didn't really make sense. Cause I, like I had a job right in a traditional sense, but even then, like, as I read that quote, I knew that it couldn't be a forever thing, you know, it, it couldn't, wow. It just couldn't be for me personally. I'm not saying it's 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 bad. It's actually a really amazing opportunity, um, and it's not saying all jobs are bad. You know, um, yeah. there's amazing jobs, and and I think there's better jobs now than there were five years ago and ten years ago. Um, I'm just saying that for me, and getting that awareness that hey, I'm I'm somebody that I I need that momentum in my life, you know, and what I'm building and, you know, any level of constraint is going to throw that off. Right. And I'm sensitive to that. And it's, it's kind of weird, right? Because like, as I look back now, I started piecing it more and more together. Um, but back then it was just kind of riding on gut. You know what I mean? It was just yeah. trying to figure myself out and, and figure where, how I can serve on, in a bigger way. Yeah. Makes sense. So it sounds like you, you learned a lot, you took away from that experience heaps and you obviously gave a lot and contributed a lot to the business but in the end it, you knew you knew you had to eventually leave because it just um it was providing that constraint that was kind of blocking your creativity for your entrepreneurship side i guess so is that is that fair to say that's the reason why you ended up leaving that eventually well i mean think about it i'm learning literally the best tools on the planet on how to help entrepreneurs get their ideas out there in a bigger, clear way, how to be able to be industry leaders, how to be able to operate within their unique ability, how to be able to build unique process and how to be able to, to, to kind of build teams around you, right? And I, did, I myself did not have a business mm. to implement said strategies, right? And I think yeah. this is what happens, to be honest, with where everybody's at right now with where most people are at. They're consuming content and they're getting to the point where they're familiar with the content. They're saying what the book says, they're they're saying and they're doing what the course is doing, but they're not like, they're not there. They're not fully committed. They don't need it to work. Do, mm. do you know what I mean? Like they're, they're comfortable with where they're at, right? And I found myself comfortable, James. I found myself really comfortable. And I thought this could be it. You know what I mean? I can just be here, make a little more money each year. Um, meet some people that, you know, increase my network this way. Um, but I, I, I always thought, Hey, you know, what, what type of person would I be if I was uncomfortable? Right. What type of setting would I have to be in? You know, who am I really? Right. And it's not that I was frustrated with, with, you know, the quote unquote job. I was inspired by the people I was working with. You know, I was inspired by their stories and, and how they looked at problems and how they wanted to go about solving problems. And, you know, some of them, some of their lives I didn't envy by any means, but I thought, wow, these are people that are out there for a lot, sometimes a lot bigger than just the paycheck. You know, yeah. they're out there and they're not, they're not just chasing money. They're chasing impact, legacy, you know, how to serve people in, in a bigger manner. And I said, hey, wh what does that feel like? You know? Mm -hmm. Um, am I doing that? Right. And, um, you know, for me, I had to kind of find my own way of, of how that, you know, how that played out. Yeah. Got it. Makes total sense. So what did happen next? Once you left strategic coach, what was your next step from there? 
Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I took kind of like a year and a bit sabbatical, I guess you could, you could say. Um, did some traveling, uh, you know, learned Mandarin, which was something I've always wow. wanted to do. Um, yeah, I was living in, in Asia. I was kind of vagabonding in, in, in China for a majority of that year. Uh, lived in Southeast Asia, Korea, South Korea, uh, not North Korea, un- unfortunately, <laughs> not, not, not as cool and yep. uh, not, not as Korean. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was it was just a, a great year of taking taking some time away. I needed to kind of detox from the life that I was living at that time. Um, and I also needed to get clarity and some space for myself, you know, to figure out what, what I wanted to do next. And, um, when I ended the sabbatical, that's kind of when I started looking at a podcast, um, and starting creating content all around there. Yeah. That's awesome. Do you think that looking back was creating that space, something that was absolutely necessary for you to do to start to define what you wanted to do? Is that something you look back on as something you're glad you did? You know, it's a, it's a great question because I don't think, you know, that's, that's the thing about advice, right? There's all I can share with everybody that's listening is that this is what was true for me, right? Mm-hmm. And this is what worked for me. And I'm not even saying that, I mean, if we talk about a very specific result with a very specific, like, let's say medium, like a podcast, I could kind of guarantee that you'll land somewhere around here right but when it comes to life and when it comes to getting clarity on your gifts and like taking space to be creative like all those things um it's hard right because what works for me might not work for you um but james if i had to be honest i I think it was a bit of a privilege you know um i i mean i worked my butt off to before you know a year and a bit beforehand to kind of save up some money to be able to do that you know, I certainly wasn't, quote unquote, living the life while I was in Shanghai. Um, you know, I picked Southeast Asia and, and Asia because I, I just knew that, you know, it would eat up my savings, but it could do it in a more kind of like in, in a way that I can kind of control better versus living in, let's say, North America um, or anywhere in the U.S. or in Canada. Um, I, I thought that the space was necessary for for me um, at that time. Uh, I could have done it in, in different ways, but I, I chose that, you know, I wanted to be kind of where someone did not know who I was, you know, mm. someone did not get a chance to influence my own decisions. And I think I had a lot of, you know, fear around making my own decisions, you know, around trying to figure out, you know, who I was and, and how I was going to go about it. Yeah. Makes total sense. Yep. So... When you came back and you, you mentioned before the, the podcast is something that you start to work on. So I was curious, um, maybe you could just tell a story of, of why you decided to start a podcast and how you kind of got that off the ground initially. Well, you know, podcasting in 2015 was a little different than it is now, right? And um, just like podcasting in 2012 was also <laughs> different than, than where it was in 2015. There was kind of the, this initial peak First, um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily wake up one day and, and thought to myself, hey, I need a podcast. That was not how it happened. You know, in fact, I probably tried, you know, I tried writing some blog pieces, like try to make that work. That didn't necessarily feel that, you know, good for me. Um, trying to make some videos, man, maybe I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm certainly better on video today. Um, but, you know, back then was it was bad. You know, and like, here's a guy who wanted to be, you know, this like this speaker, someone who wanted to help people in a a positive way. And and I was still trying to figure out like how I wanted to be able to do that um, and and figuring out my own systems and frameworks around self-help and and self-improvement and mindset. Um, And I wanted to talk about all those things because, you know, all those things had made such a tremendous difference for me personally. Um, But I didn't know how to do like good video. I was like so nervous. I was, it was really awkward. Um, and you know, I was sharing this with a group of, of, uh, entrepreneurs and and business leaders and they said, Hey, have you ever thought of having an audio show where you're not on video, you know, Mm -hmm. and you could, you know, do some interviews and you could do some solo episodes and you can kind of like, like ease in, 
you know what I mean, to the whole content creation side of things. And that's actually how it happened. And, and I did it in about uh, just over a month. And, um, you know, talked with a couple of people that had really great shows and, uh, you know, we launched and, and, you know, to my surprise, uh, we were able to be in the top 100 back then new and noteworthy was like a section that people actually wanted to get into. Um, I don't think it even exists anymore today, but, um, you know, that, that's how we were able to kind of get some of the initial momentum and traction and just get some listeners, you know what I mean? Get a bit of an audience and then try to figure out how you can serve them. And so, where did a lot of your initial guests come from? Was it mostly from your network? You obviously had a, a strong network from your previous work with, with Dan Sullivan, strategic coach. Is that where a lot of them came from or what was kind of your process there? You know, I always believed um, and still to this day, part of the ways, part of the reasons we, we, we've been able to even be successful with our agency is because our whole team believes in not only a white glove approach, but a personalized approach, you know? Mm. Um, I was never a big fan of, you know, mass like messaging everybody. And, you know, I think automation plays a certain role on the back end of, of businesses, but when it came to building that relationship, maybe it kind of goes back to like the whole, like knocking on the door, you know what I mean? Yeah. When it came to that initial, how are we gonna get them to notice us and how are we gonna get into a conversation with them? Um, I always believed in a personalized approach. Mm. And that's honestly um, what I leaned on. You know, I've tried to figure out how could I find a way of standing out, especially when I was not as proven, you know, especially when I didn't have a really big platform. I didn't have a massive email list or a big audience, right? Um, how can I go ahead and add value to that person's life? Right? How can I add value to what they're looking to do? You know? Mm -hmm. And I tried to never look at it like, okay, how could I just get an hour of their time? You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and so I always took that approach whenever we found individuals that, you know, one, were really inspiring, and, and two, um, they also had a similar type of audience, right? That I wanted to be able to access, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always like so, um, so technical, you know, it wasn't always so like, oh, this person, you know, has this giant audience, so let's interview him or her. It was always like, hey, are we gonna have a great like time? Are we gonna have a great vibe? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because um, I have found that it's sometimes not your, it's not like the people that have the biggest audiences or the biggest platforms that are the best interviews. It's yeah. people that, everyday people, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's people that are willing to be human you know, willing to say, hey, this is what works. I don't know if it's going to work for you, but this is what I did, right? Yep. And, and these are the things that they're, they're willing to be vulnerable. They're willing to tell you the truth, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I've, I've definitely found that as well. I've had a mixture of various um, people who are, are at various stages in their journeys and some of the best conversations, as you said, have been with people who are relatively unknown and sort of just earlier in their journey and and as you said they're they're willing to to open up and be vulnerable so that's i totally get that so you started growing your audience you mentioned a few ways you, you started to do that which is great and with your podcast specifically i guess you've kind of it's kind of evolved a bit which we'll talk about in a second to in terms of your main focus but i guess with the podcast itself what does it actually mean to you like what what were you hoping to achieve initially by starting the podcast is it was it really, this is your way of trying to bring impact and, and value to people? Um, were you just trying to sharpen your skills initially? Like what was your, your kind of thought process in those early stages? So the theme of the show, The Inner Change Maker, has always been this idea of, you know, legacy over currency, right? The idea of how do you create legacy, right? How do you do that? You know, and I remember being you know, 20 something, whenever I started and it was like, I didn't know how to answer that. Right. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of sometimes interviews is you don't have to do a lot of the talking. You know what I mean? <laughs> I could, I could bring on the, the New York bestseller. I can bring on the millionaire and the billionaire for them to kind of share their little gems, you know, yeah. and their frameworks and systems. And for me, it was like, that's amazing. You know, like one, we get to build a relationship Two, I don't have to like 
reinvent the wheel per se, right? And then three, if I even, a lot of times, if I'm inspired by their work and their book, I can kind of go deeper with them, you know what I mean? And 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 get a chance to see their kind of frameworks and systems from from that perspective and, and kind of learn little tidbits here and there, right? Um, there's so many moments, you know, of, of those conversations. You know, I remember, you know, when I chatted with Grant Cardone, you mentioned him in, in the intro, I said, hey, the theme of the show, Grant, is creating legacy over currency. And he says, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and I said, okay, this is this is a great start. Yeah, I, I like that. I totally agree, right? And he's like, well, he's like, do, do you know why? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> um, I've, I've done like 50 of these interviews, so this is this is terrible timing that you're telling me now. And he goes, well, Jay, you need money. You need currency to build the legacy that you want. So it's not about choosing one over the other. It's about both, right? Mm-hmm. And I go, wow, that's interesting. You know, yeah. I've had people come on and tell me, I'm pretty sure uh, it was Tucker Max um, that uh, he runs, uh, you know, he, he's written some amazing New York bestsellers, uh, you know, and, and he runs a, a great little uh, scribe media, I'm pretty sure, because yeah. they changed their name recently. Um, yeah. But he, he was a guy who came on and said, legacy, don't even worry about that. Like, mm-hmm. don't like you don't even need to worry about legacy. Like, that's it's too far. Right. Like it's not. So it's, there's all these different opinions. You know what I mean? Yep. There's all, you know, certain authors that I look up to that they have their viewpoint on what they're doing and how their work is impacting leaders and parents and men and women. And, you know, so it, it becomes this this open conversation, you know, and I, I've always thought audio was like one of the best gifts. You know, podcasting is one of the best life hacks in general. Yes. Doesn't Don't even worry about the business stuff that comes from it. It's just like. What an amazing way that you get a chance to record your own breakthroughs, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like I'm sure even you've been podcasting now for you know a year, at least with this show, almost a year, right? Um, I'm sure it's influenced the way that you operate and you think. Right. You know what I mean? Like just by getting the different collections of ideas, and it's not to say who's right and who's wrong. It's more so to say, hey, these these are the ideas. You know, take what you need. And maybe challenge the way that you're currently operating. Yeah, totally. And you're right. It's it's almost like a great way to just document your own journey, and then the fact that you're you're interviewing these interesting people that are actually affecting your thoughts and your outlook on things, and then seeing that that change and how you're evolving over time is really cool and powerful. So I totally get that. <laughs> and can you talk a bit about, I guess, the how this podcast has evolved over time. So obviously you're still still doing the podcast, it's still a big part of what you're doing, but it has kind of evolved, or maybe a better way to say it is your, your there's things that have come from that that your focus has now um, evolved onto. So maybe you could talk a bit about uh, what happened next in terms of that, like how it evolved into the agency. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's just funny because I think when... I, in the beginning, when I started the podcast, we were doing all, I was like, do I spent like the whole week, you know what I mean? Like editing and like putting up the blog posts and then like creating like the social media things and, you know, sharing the episodes and uh, giving, like telling my guests like how well their numbers are doing. Like, I, you know, I did all these like things and like I didn't have that like I didn't have like a coach or like a mentor especially in that beginning phase so I was just like figuring all these things out right and one of the most uh, things that I I was trying to figure out I would go to like these meetups and these dinners and no matter what anybody would talk about I would say hey how do I make money doing this Mm. like I'm spending all this time doing this and like yeah like I think it's amazing like I feel like I'm learning I feel like I'm growing I feel like I'm expanding but I don't know how sustainable this is, one, yeah. you know, and two, what do people do to like make money at this point? Right. <laughs> and, you know, it, 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 it like, I, yeah, I want to create a legacy, but I'm going to run out of money before I do so. Do, yeah. do you see what I'm saying? And yep. so it, it was just and, and I think a lot of young entrepreneurs and people that are just starting out, they, they hit this, you know, they have this amazing vision of how this whole thing is going to play out. And they're hit with that reality once they start doing it that, you know, let's, you know, having a team, for example, 
comes with an investment. You know what I mean? Having someone to help you with like producing content on like six different channels or 10 different channels comes with an investment. You know what I mean? It, typically it's in either investment of time or investment of money, right? Mm -hmm. And so being young, the advantage is that you have time, right? Yes. And, 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 that's, and that's fine. But is the, the question is, are you optimizing and using that time to not only work hard, but to work smart as well, right? And this is something that took me a long time to understand. I understood the words consciously, as in like, oh, I know all those words. Those are not complicated words, you know what I mean? But I didn't, once again, I, I wasn't implementing it, wasn't doing it in my, in, in my life. And I think anytime you start out, because you haven't figured out how to make money yet, you get really good at the things that you get really good at, right? It yes. kind of becomes like your own craftsmanship, you know what I mean? So yeah. interviewing became what I could get really good at, you know what I mean? The podcast became what I become really great at. And the funny thing is when you build up an audience, naturally, just kind of like how this interview would happen, naturally people are curious about what are you doing to get the result that you're going after, right? Maybe they're going after a similar result, right? And what happens is that your audience, if you listen carefully, your audience will tell you how you can help them and serve them in a bigger way. Does that make sense, James? Absolutely. And this is where this is where a lot of like young entrepreneurs and, and people that are starting out, they get this wrong. They just go, they you know, what they do is like, hey, I got this idea. I'm gonna spend all this time, all this money, I'm gonna create this idea, this product, doesn't matter if it's like a live product or an online product, right? And and they never, they, they fail to get the feedback from the people that actually matters, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's been an evolution because my audience has kind of grown with me over the last few years, you know? And, and in the beginning they would ask, hey, could you, could you teach us how to be able to launch a podcast? You know, could you teach us how to be able to reach out to millionaires and billionaires, right? How do I get into the top 100? How do I monetize my own show? You know, these are questions that till this day I get asked quite a bit. And over time, that audience has also evolved. You know, it's evolved into people asking and saying, hey, look, um, the reason the whole agency came about, it's not because I woke up one day and said I wanted to do an agency. It's simply because we had a lot of people that were within our, our my, like my email list and within my network that said, hey, I have no interest in you teaching me how to launch a podcast, how to be able to do any of this stuff. In fact, I don't want to know. Mm. I just want a top 100 podcast. Mm. I simply want to be able to get my message out there and create content. Can you, can you and your team do everything else? Mm. And I said, yeah, we can do something. We can do something together, but you got to write a check. This is where yep. the time is. You write, you write a big check, and let's see how this plays out. The first yeah. time I did this, the check wasn't big enough, so we lost <laughs> money on the deal. But it's okay, right? Because what is life? Life is you learn, yep. right? It's about mastering certain things. And so we got, we figured out what is the right amount for people to invest. We figured out what are the right things for them to to need and and want from our team. And so that is something that we've been, you know, specializing and working in. Um, specific around that that white glove podcast agency really over the last like year and a bit. Uh, and, and it's just been tremendous because the people we get a chance to serve, you know, they're impacting thousands and sometimes millions of people, you know, not just through their podcast, but through their brand. Right. Yeah. And it's given me a very unique view of how to be able to take a show, leverage a show and be able to have that show be an extension of your marketing and of your values. That's amazing. I love how it's how it's come about as well. As you said, you're you're listening and you're looking for that need and that problem that you can solve instead of what most people do or what a lot of people tend to do, which is try to create something, um, create a, a problem for a need. And it's like the wrong way around. So I love the way that's come about and it makes total sense to me. And so How's everything going with with the agency now? Can you share any numbers in terms of like how many clients you're working with, or just give us a general sense of of what sort of impact you're having with that now? Yeah, you know, it's it's. Uh, I appreciate you asking. Um, and I was literally just on 
Uh, I literally think I shared this one clip like like an hour before we hopped on, maybe not even like half an hour before. Um, and I was I was on an interview just last week and they asked kind of a similar question. I said, you know, what's funny about that is I actually just counted like two days ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to report that over the last couple of years, since I've been speaking and teaching and consulting on the topic, that we've helped over 116 entrepreneurs and, and, and shows be able to launch, you know, mm-hmm. and more specifically, in the last eight, nine months, we've helped over nine shows hit the top 100 from the agency. Wow. So... <laughs> Yeah, and and look, these are we we have a launch going on. I'm not even joking, and this is not like oh, this is like all happening all at the perfect time. As you know, it took a little while to get this interview going, um, but we have a launch going on tomorrow with yep. an amazing client who's who's a poet who's written some some really great books, and you know she's going to be impacting literally millions of her listeners and her audience tomorrow like it's happening like you know 8 9 a.m right there's an entire <laughs> launch plan we literally just went over it this morning you know um i'm not going to say which podcast it is but by the time you, you put this out we, we could certainly link to the show um okay. and and be able to to kind of give her a little bit of support and a little bit of a boost but don't you know let me call it ahead of time we haven't missed hitting the top 100 of any of our clients anytime this year so, wow. you know, we're, we're super excited about that. Um, and, and look, th- these are some of the people we work with, right? People that have a million people on her Instagram, you know, people that have a few books that want to have that TV show that want to be able to add that, that authority and celebrity to what they're doing and what they're building already. Um, you know, we've, we, we've gotten a chance to uh, consult, you know, some of the presidential candidates that are wow. currently happening in the U.S. Um, around launching their show, around what that would look like, you know what I mean? Um, and 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 it's just been really amazing, you know, to once again peer in the back end and see how sometimes it's a big company, sometimes it's a small brand. Regardless, there's different ways of leveraging the show to be able to get to where you want to go. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, it sounds like it's been quite a journey. So yeah, I'm sure that will continue and, and the best is yet to come, I'm sure. So thanks for sharing that. And I want to be mindful of your time here, Jay. So we're sort of coming up on the, the end of the interview here, but just a few more quick questions for you. I just want to know what's coming up next for you. So it sounds like this is definitely your main project at the moment, the podcast, Done For Your Podcast Agency. So it, what's what's coming up in the next six to 12 months for you, any, any specifically big things happening? So I love that you, t- I love that we're talking here and James, I'm going to give you the honor. I'm going to, I'm going to just put this on record. All right. Because <laughs> that maybe it's because it took you, it took us a while to get this like nailed down, but this is the first interview that I'm doing in our new studio, in our new mm-hmm. office. And uh, this week, part of the reason it's been so crazy is because we've been trying to move and, you know, closing on this property. Um, And so it's super exciting because over the last few years, believe it or not, it's going to sound very tiring for some of you. um, But trust me, having lived it, I'm exhausted. You can tell, right? Um, (laughs) But there's a this is and and this is I'm going to certainly lean into this more and more. But, you know, we're going to like be very, very serious about the next season's worth of content that's going to be coming out on my YouTube channel, Jay Wong TV, and as well as on the podcast, The Interchange Maker. And part of that is because over the last, because I like, you know, here's the thing. I think because you evolve so much, James, like as a podcast host, your show changes with you. You know what I mean? It evolves with you. Right. I think that's the beauty of it. And what I'm trying to get at is that over the last three years, my girlfriend and I, we've traveled. We did the whole digital nomad thing. We've lived in different areas, sometimes in Italy, sometimes in the West Coast, sometimes in different parts of Canada and sometimes in different parts of Europe. And in my opinion, you can get to you can grow your content in, in a certain way when you do things like that. Certainly on Instagram, it looks very sexy. Right. Um, 
and and certainly you know there was a lot of you know moments where we're massively grateful to to have had those experiences but i'm also very grateful to have a home base you know yeah, i'm it. very grateful to have a place where we're going to look at to create content on a very consistent basis you know to be able to be dialed in with your creativity you know to have the right type of triggers around you when yeah. i say triggers typically it's a negative connotation but you know actual triggers that are going to remind you of the mission and and the things of why you're doing what you're doing you know and you don't really get that when you're traveling you know i get it so it's like I'm, I'm massively pumped for all of this. Um, if, if we turn on the video camera right now, you'd be looking at, you know, two tables, you know, with water bottles and coffee <laughs> and headphones and, and, and cameras and, and there's luggage like all around. There's boxes behind me. There's books and nothing is packed and nothing is put up and there's, you know, holes in the walls. And it's like, what is going on, you know? Um, but just like I think life and I think, a lot of times for a lot of us, you know, we're very much a work in progress, you know, and I'm grateful that we got the chance to kind of hang out and, and, and geek out a little bit. I'm grateful that you, you guys got a chance to hear a little bit of my story, but you know, this is very much a work in progress and I'm looking forward to the next 12 months because it's going to be pretty amazing to see what happens uh, when we become a lot more consistent with the, the content we're creating and ultimately helping more of the people um, that are change makers, but that are really the thought leaders of, of the next generation. Yeah, it's an amazing mission. And, and I'm honored to be the, the first interview in your new studio, although it sounds like we can't quite call it a studio yet, but I'm sure in a, a right, week right. or so, it'll, it'll be. be yeah. it's, it's one totally of the mystery up. rooms in this property. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, is there anything I haven't asked you, Jay, or just anything you want to make sure you pass on to the audience before we finish up here? No, I mean, I, I think you've, you've done a, a really great job of actually, you know, dissecting and, and taking a look at, at, the, at the whole timeline. Um, a lot of times, actually, in, in recent interviews, people don't want to necessarily hear the whole story. Mm. You know, they want to get to the, like, hey, how do we get to the top 100? How do we make money online? Uh-huh. Right? How, how, how do we build a business that we can actually, you know, be proud of and, 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 and gives us joy? Uh, but maybe we could save that for a part two. Who knows? Yeah, well, we'll definitely have to get you back on at some point. Um, maybe when the studio is set up and we could maybe go through some more nuts and bolts. But I love digging into the story behind what you're up to and... Yeah, I just really appreciate you coming on, Jay. I know you're a very busy guy, so I really appreciate you making the time, especially in such a busy period for you. So thank you for coming on and sharing all your experience and knowledge. I really appreciate it. And what's the best way for people to connect with you? If people want to check out the agency, if they want to um, just see what you're up to, what's the best way? Yeah, if you're serious about getting a top 100 show and you are a creative emerging thought leader you can go to doneforyoupodcast.co doneforyoupodcast.co and take a look at some of the uh, amazing thought leaders and business owners that we've been able to not only get them into the top 100 but actually be able to leverage their show to actually drive and amplify their 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 brand um so that that's certainly a, a place that you guys can take a look at and if you just want to follow kind of behind the scenes and actually keep me accountable to my promise of more videos and more content uh you can follow me at the j wong on pretty much every social media channel um and j wong tv for youtube awesome thanks so much jay appreciate it Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to this interview with Jay. Hope you got a lot of value from it. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you use Apple Podcasts. If you could go in and leave this show a rating and a review, that would really help me out a lot. And even if you don't use Apple Podcasts, you can still help me. Just take a screenshot of yourself listening to this interview. You can post it to Instagram stories and make sure you tag me in that. My handle is at J Harris, which is J H A double R I triple S. And if you could do one of those two things, it would really help me out and it would mean a lot. Hope you have a great day.